Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Vunatu Sahaviryam Karavavai Tejas Vrinavati Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us. May he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Peace, peace, peace. And good evening. Welcome back to our Friday evening readings. We are continuing with various lectures of Swami Abhedananda, one of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, who spent about 25 years in the West lecturing in both the America and in Europe. Uh, but before I begin the reading, I thought I'd just say, I uh, wish everyone a happy uh, Ganesha Chaturthi and a uh, happy Krishna Janmashtami, which happened a couple of weeks ago. And uh, just a couple of words about those two events. Uh, Krishna uh, really symbolizes the harmony of religions. The Bhagavad Gita really summarized all the different spiritual traditions within Hinduism uh, at that time. And so that's a, it's a wonderful compilation of all of the spiritual wisdom. And then another aspect that's very important, I think, is that uh, you can think of Krishna in so many different lights. Uh, so depending on your particular bhakta inclination, you can think of Krishna as the baby Krishna. You can think of him as, the, as your eternal friend, the cowherd boy, uh, your eternal lover, or your eternal guide, like on the battlefield, as we take our battlefield through life here. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita can, and Sri Krishna can be our guide. Uh, and so there, there are just so many different relationships that you can think of Sri Krishna in, in those roles. So th then on Ganesha, uh, that's being celebrated tomorrow, depending on the calendar you look at, it's usually listed for tomorrow. And Ganesha is a very important deity. He, traditionally, he's worshipped uh, at the beginning of any other worship uh, to remove all the obstacles for the puja to proceed in the way it should be uh, going. Uh, it's a very interesting symbol. Uh, symbolically, Krishna represents that energy of God that connects realms, connects different worlds. So here we are kind of stuck in this realm of Maya, and we're trying to access the spiritual realm. So Ganesha is the one that helps us do that. Uh, just as he was the gatekeeper in front of uh, Mother Parvati's room, he's the gatekeeper to the divine universe. Uh, the divine mother represents the divine universe. And so he is the gatekeeper, and you need to propitiate the gatekeeper. Uh, but uh, his symbolism being with the elephant's head and so forth, traditionally, if you look at worldwide uh, symbolism, uh, other deities that uh, are, have animal components to their uh, makeup also represent gatekeepers or some being that needs to be propitiated for journeys or uh, for some sort of connection with another realm. So that's kind of Ganesha in, in a very short nutshell. All right, so this lecture by Swami Abedananda uh, was called The Ideal of Education. And if I can find the beginning of it, I'm going to skip parts of it. The Ideal of Education, it was delivered at the Bihar Young Men's Institute in Patna on January 27, 1925. So that was after he had returned to India. And so the first few pages, he's kind of recounting what he did uh, in the West and how he uh, talked about the Indian scriptures and so forth to the people of the West. Uh, then <clears throat> and he talked about the various people that he met and so forth, uh, various scholars that were introducing uh, Hindu ideas to the West. 
Then he begins uh, the main part of his talk uh, with this paragraph. <clears throat> The subject of this evening makes me think of the past glory of India and our holy motherland. The civilization and culture of ancient India were grand and glorious. India has contributed her culture to the Western nations in various branches of knowledge. The world owes its first lessons in geometry and algebra to India. The 47th proposition of Euclid, a square on the hypotenuse of a right-angled triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides, was ascribed to Pythagoras, but it was known in India centuries before Pythagoras was born. It is mentioned in the Solbas Sutras of the Vedic age. Algebra was introduced into Europe from researchers here. We have gathered that Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine of Europe, who lived about 400 BC, borrowed his Materia Medica from India. In chemistry, as also in surgery, we know from the study of the Shushruta that Hindus excelled other nations. We know from the accounts that have been left to us by Bagastanes the Greek ambassador who lived in the court of Chandragupta in the fourth century before Christ, that Alexander the Great used to keep Hindu physicians in his camp because he preferred them to the Greek physicians. Nurtus and Arian spoke highly of the wonderful healing powers of the Arabs who learned it in India, and Leonardo de Pisa, introduced it into Italy several centuries uh, and several countries of Europe in the 13th century. In fact, geometry, algebra, trigonometry, all these were first taught in India. The Arabs learned these from India and carried them into the West. The world owes decimal notation to India. It was unknown to the Greeks and Romans. And arithmetic, as a practical science, would have been impossible without decimal notation. The world owes its first lessons of medicine to India. Although there is general belief that Europe derived her knowledge of medicine from Greece, still she is indebted to the Hindu physicians. In various branches of science, philosophy, art, and music, the Hindus were the first teachers. For instance, the Greeks had five notes of music at first, but the Hindus developed seven notes of music and had three octaves long before the Greek had three octaves long before the Greeks had them. During the Vedic period, uh, Sama Veda was used to, be, used to be sung and chanted with these notes. Wagner's music, with its special motifs, was indebted to Indian music. Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher, had a conversation with Wagner on this subject, from which we learn that the great German musician Wagner studied the Latin translation of the Sanskrit science of music, and that he learned from Sanskrit science of music those principal motifs which had made his music so original and so wonderful. In other branches of knowledge also, India developed her culture to be a great, to a great extent, for instance, in astronomy, and in developing the theory of evolution of the world out of Prakriti, the eternal cosmic energy as described in the Sankhya system of philosophy. All these different branches of study were highly developed in India centuries before Christ, and even today the European scholars admit this fact. I can quote from Sir Mone Williams, who in his book entitled Brahmanism and Hinduism says that, quote, the Hindus were Spinozites more than 2,000 years before the existence of Spinoza and Darwinians many centuries before Darwin and evolutionists many centuries before the doctrine of evolution had been accepted by the scientists of our time and before any word like evolution existed in the language of the world." Unquote. His remarks were correct because we learn from the philosophy of the Sankhya that the whole world was not created by an extra cosmic personal God who is sitting on his throne above the clouds, but that there 
was one eternal cosmic energy, which was called by the name of Prakriti, the Latin, the same as the Latin procreatrix, the creative energy of the universe. This energy is indestructible and uncreatable, yet changeable. It is one and eternal. Today, Western science admits that there is only one eternal cosmic energy, the sum total of which neither increases nor decreases. This fact was established by Kapila, the founder of the Sankhya system of philosophy in the seventh century before Christ. We had our Newton in Aryabhata, who lived about 476 AD and who declared that the earth was moving upon its own axis around the sun. Long before the Copernican system of astronomy was known to the Europeans, this Aryabhata system was taught in India, and it was Aryabhata who first declared that the law of gravitation existed. He called it Majikarshana, that is, the attraction towards the center. We had our Shakespeare in Kalidasa, we had our philosopher greater than Kant and Hegel in Shankaracharya, greater than Hume and Berkeley in Vaish, uh, Vashishta, and we had materialistic philosophy in the system of Canada. The atomic theory of Canada is a, one, is a wonder to the Western minds because in such an early age, that is in the pre-Buddhistic period, Canada proved to the world that this external universe was made up of minute particles of matter, anus, or atoms, which were indestructible. Again, we find that these atoms of Canada were not the final particles of the material world, but particles finer than atoms were discovered by Kapila. And he called them tanmantras, which would be similar to the electrons and protons of modern science. The electrons are the force centers of the negative energy, and the protons are of positive electricity. Such great advancements was made in the different branches of knowledge and science in the pre-Buddhistic age, which lasted between 1400 BC and 600 BC. Well, that would be an interesting thing to investigate to see if we can uh, figure out a correspondence between the Tan Mantras and some of these subatomic particles. Don't think I've ever quite thought of it that way. <laughs> but uh, it's very possible that there is a, a connection there. Uh, and of course, um, <clears throat> it's a shame that the uh, Indian ideas had not gotten wider uh, acceptance through the world. A uh, few things trickled in now and again, but so much of it uh, didn't trickle in. And so uh, a lot of that just uh, remained in the Indian subcontinent to be rediscovered later. But there was enough little things that did come through, like the Pythagorean theorem. But the, uh, even Pythagoras, I don't think, claims to have discovered it, but maybe he did. Uh, but certainly Euclid, uh, didn't claim to discover all the things in his elements. He was just putting everything together that was known at the time. And that, that was fairly common in those days. Uh, you would just gather all the knowledge that you could and put it together. And so sometimes it would get ascribed to you. Uh, so, and of course, as far as uh, medicine goes, of course, the plants available in India would not necessarily be available in the West, so you're going to end up with different kind of herbal medicines in different countries, uh, except, of course, from trade, and that was certainly the spices were a big part of the, the trade route, and many of the spices have uh, medicinal properties as well. So anyways, a fascinating uh, history that he's kind of summarized here as to all the different things that were discovered uh, among the, the Hindu scriptures. <clears throat> Sometimes it's a bit codified. Uh, it's put in terms that uh, aren't that familiar to the Western mind. And so you, have to, you almost have to know it before you read it to understand, oh, that's what they're saying. Oh, that's the Pythagorean theorem. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, if you had just read it without that, you might not even understand what they're saying. Uh, it's not always that obvious. <clears throat> All right, so then he's going on in another vein. 
Then in moral and spiritual lines, the Hindus were the first teachers in the world. Centuries before the Christian era, nay, long before Moses gave the Ten Commandments to the nomadic tribes of Israel in that remote antiquity, when the European nations were eating raw animal flesh, living in caves and forests, tattooing their bodies, wearing animal skins, the civilization of India was in high glory. The dawn of civilization first broke not upon the horizon of Greece, Europe, or Arabia, but upon the horizon of India. India is not a country of today, but she had the sublime teachings of Vedanta before the time of Moses, when Krishna sang the Bhagavad Gita in the battlefield of Kurukshetra. All those who came in touch with India were benefited. During the Buddhistic period, as we know from the edicts of Ashoka, Buddhist preachers were sent out to different parts of the then civilized world, from Siberia to Ceylon and from China to Egypt. Buddhist monks traveled and preached the gospel of love for all and the highest ethics of humanitarianism in foreign countries. Those teachings of Buddha were afterwards emphasized in the teachings of Jesus the Christ. Christianity can be traced back to the Hindu ideals in many of its doctrines and dogmas. The principal part of Christianity, that is baptism, was not known among the Jews of that time, but it came from the Ganges, as Ernst Renan has said in his life of Jesus. You know, when you think about it, can you imagine being, say, in Alexander the Great's uh, campaign and going to India and then trying to learn and uh, when we think how difficult it is for, at least for me, it's really difficult to learn a foreign language. I have trouble just learning it in a class over s several years. And so here these people are trying to learn to communicate. And obviously trade, though, had been going on for a long time. So there must have been a few people that uh, had made it their job to translate from one country to another as they made their uh, trade routes along, uh, the, along the way. Uh, but really, it's amazing to think that people could pick that up. Were the Buddhist people going to China and Japan, and where the, the script is different and the intonation is so important? It's really phenomenal, I think, that these people were able to communicate and get things translated and so forth. Uh, it's, re it's really quite uh, amazing, I think. Now, he, <clears throat> he makes a good point here in this next section that uh, and this may explain some of the reasons why some of these ideas from India didn't get wide circulation, probably because they didn't put quite as much importance on them because their main emphasis was more on spiritual things, that the, the spiritual ideal was the highest as opposed to figuring out how things worked in the physical universe. But they seem to have gotten a, quite a bit of information about how the physical universe worked. Uh, it's just that it wasn't their top priority. The education of a nation, uh, Vedananda goes on, depends upon its ideal of civilization. The Hindu ideal of civilization from prehistoric times was purely moral and spiritual. Consequently, the civilization of ancient India was based not upon commercial principles of modern times and not upon the selfish ideal of political gain and power over other nations, but upon the eternal spiritual laws which govern our soul. Intellectual culture was not regarded as the highest ideal, but spiritual realization of the relation that exists between the individual soul and the universal spirit was the principal aim of education. Education, as Herbert Spencer has said, quote, is the training for the completeness of life, unquote. Education will bring about the perfection of the person which is already latent in the person's soul. Education does not mean that a lot of ideas or information will be poured into the brain of the individual and then they will run riot there, but it means that the gradual growth and development of the soul from its infancy to maturity. Education should be based upon the spiritual ideal that each individual soul is potentially divine, that it possesses infinite potentiality and infinite possibility, and that knowledge cannot come from outside into inside, but that all knowledge evolves from inside. No one can teach you, but you teach yourself 
and the teachers only give you suggestions. This should be the principle of education. Today, in our universities, we find just the opposite principle. A student is allowed to study and memorize the notes of his professors and pass the examinations. Then he comes out as a pashakara murka, a learned fool. He gets a diploma for his ignorance. <laughs> That is not the ideal of education. Education does not mean intellectual culture, but it means the development and spiritual unfoldment of the soul in all the various branches of learning. Although I, I must say that sometimes you get the feeling that some Hindu education is based largely on memorizing huge tasks of memorizing huge volumes of scriptures and uh, so forth. And sometimes I get the feeling that the people that have memorized them have not thought very deeply about what, they're, what they've memorized. I may be wrong, but um, sometimes I get that impression. It seems like it's just sort of pouring out randomly without, uh, without a lot of thought sometimes. Uh, but certainly uh, when I went through school, I, I realized that you know, I could read something and I could hear something, but I had to really think about it and try to put it in my own words or to solve problems with that knowledge so that I really knew how it worked. Otherwise, it, it really didn't sink in. <laughs> I had to do something with the knowledge before it sank in. I would even make up things, especially for subjects that were harder for me, like uh, history. I would make up tasks uh, that I had to do in order to uh, organize the information so that I could work with it and coordinate it and somehow get it to sink in. <laughs> the ideal of education in America is revolutioning, uh, revolutionizing the ideals of past ages. Today, an infant boy or girl of four or five years of age in America is allowed to go to the kindergarten schoolroom where all kinds of toys, music boxes, pictures for painting and drawing are kept. The children are allowed to go inside that room and are asked to choose what they would like in order to know their natural inclinations. This sounds almost like a Montessori school that he's visiting. I'm not sure this is every kindergarten, but anyway. That's nice that he got a good impression. If anyone is attracted to the music box, he would excel in music, and therefore such training should be given to him as would make him the best musician of the world. He should therefore not be allowed to go into a college and become a graduate in the literary line, which would mean nothing to him. Some, someone would be a painter and another would be an athlete. In every branch of learning, one must excel. The, the stereotyped way of getting a degree like an BA or an MA and then becoming a clerk is not the ideal of education. By following this method, we are ruining our young men. <laughs> yeah, I can remember, uh, again, trying to learn something that I wasn't very good at, which was history. I, <laughs> I would make up uh, poems uh, that went to tunes that I had on music boxes, and then I would play the music box and I would repeat the little tune, uh, re repeat the little information so I could remember it. Education should be according to the natural inclination of the individual soul, with the idea that wisdom cannot be drilled into the brain of the individual, and that all the books give mere suggestions, and in reaction, we get the knowledge of the book. In order to understand a book, our mind must vibrate or be in rapport with the mind of the author. Then we get knowledge by itself, for it is a process of transmission. Knowledge does not come from outside. We will have to raise the vibration of our mind to the level of the vibration of the mind of the author. And then, like wireless telegraphy, the wisdom of the author's mind will be communicated to the student's mind. That is the natural principle of proper education. Well, that's, I uh, certainly understand that, that, and certainly I'm sure you've all experienced this too. You, some books you read and it's kind of just torture to get through them. They just, you, you're just not, it's just not sinking in. Somehow the author's style, and it could be a very popular author that a lot of people like, but somehow it doesn't click with you. It's just not put in the kind of terms that are familiar to you. And whereas another book 
just practically reads itself. You just whip right through it, and, and it's, you understand everything that's in the book uh, from one reading, uh, no problem. Same thing with teachers. And I certainly remember as a teacher, some of my students found it very easy to follow what I said and thought I was a great teacher, and others just couldn't follow me. Then <laughs> I often thought it was too bad we didn't have some sort of test, like he was thinking uh, here, or you just observe the student's uh, inclination. Some sort of test you could give that would match up students with teachers, because you know some teachers were just better at other students than I was, and I was better at some students than they were. Uh, but uh, you know they're randomly assigned during. Uh, uh, sign in, what did we call it? Uh, registration week. <laughs> and you just kind of got whatever class you ended up uh, stuck in or whatever period it was available. It may have been the last last period that uh, that particular course was available and so you didn't have a choice. So that's, that's some of the difficulties of education is that uh, not every teacher is going to be perfect for every student and not every subject is perfect for every student. No, oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned that when they're young, I think their tendency is to go for music or something, yeah. then you teach them. But you also notice that things change also. Especially at the younger age. Yeah. You know, they'll finish it for one or two years, and then suddenly they have interest for something else. So that's Right. So I don't know. Can they hear that? So Jit, yeah, Jit's uh, mentioning how sometimes our interests change, uh, that as a young kid, you might uh, be real interested in, in the music box, say, eh? and then all of a sudden, uh, when you reach your teens or something, you become fascinated with science or you become yeah. fascinated with writing or something. And so certainly that does happen. So yeah, that's another danger is to pigeonhole somebody so early that the, then they don't have options yeah. later on. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a valid uh, problem. And certainly I know there are some cases where people have known from a very young age what they're interested in and others just kind of don't really know or they think they're interested in one thing and then all of a sudden they they maybe have to take a general interest class in psychology or in uh, religion or in some other subject and that suddenly feels like uh, something they're passionate about. Yeah, I mean, in college it was pr pretty common to have a lot of people in the undecided category where they <laughs> still hadn't made up their mind even when they were in college. Uh, all right, uh, <clears throat> so he's asking, are we doing that? Are we actually uh, uh, getting through to students? Are we able to have the student's vibration of mind in sync with the teacher? And he says, no, but we had that system in ancient India. The present university system is going to be out of place because in England, the professors are beginning to realize the efficiency of our old brahmacharya vidyapita. A professor would have a few students around him. He would, uh, he would be their guardian. <laughs> That's a pretty good student-teacher ratio. And would be, a, <laughs> it's not like the public schools where it's about one to 35 in some cases. Uh, it's usually not quite that bad, but there are a lot of schools where it's that bad. And they've had so many teachers drop out during the pandemic that they simply don't want to come back, that they're struggling to fill, fill slots now. It's very sad. Uh, a professor would have a few students around him. He would be their guardian and would be of pure character, spotless in his ideals. He would be a moral man. He would not be like a man who gets a large pay and lives an immoral life. Such a man is not going to be the ideal teacher. And this method is going to be taken up in Europe and America in the future. In that system, the student will uh, find an example and the example is better than precept. One living example will change the whole character of the student, and it will mold his career according to the ideal which is before him. Therefore, the present system of education is not a perfect one. <clears throat> Again, the ideal of a nation should be the ideal of education. Our minds are running towards the spiritual ideal. What is the cause of it? Because we have learned all these different branches of science 
from religion. In Europe, religion was against scientific culture. Christianity stood against all intellectual development and all, against all science and all improvements. Think of the miserable condition of Galileo who said that the earth was moving. The Roman church put him in a dungeon under torture and asked him to retract his statement. But Galileo said, no, you can torture me today, but the earth still moves. I cannot <laughs> retract it, for it is the truth. That truth is an established fact of modern astronomy. The warfare between science and religion in Europe was a long-standing one. It has not stopped yet. The fire of Inquisition was kindled and hundreds were burnt alive at the stake, simply because they did not submit their intellect to the dogmas of the church. Giordano Bruno was burnt alive in the streets of Rome in 1600 AD because he was a believer in one supreme spirit whose body was matter and mind was the cosmic one. So my friends, if religion were powerful in Europe today, there would have been no scientific culture and no improvements uh, or discovery because their religion says about the creation in six days out of nothing, while modern science teaches evolution with scientific facts. Religion tells them that the earth was created 6,000 years ago before our sun came into existence, but modern astronomy teaches that the sun was created before the earth, and geology tells us that our earth is millions of years old. More like four billion, four and a half billion, anyway. And the first appearance of man was about 100,000 years ago. How can we reconcile these contradictory statements? If we accept one, we shall have to reject the other. But in our country, my friends, Sanatana Dharma never stood against science or free thought. You may believe in God or you may not, but so long as you're a moral and spiritual man, you, uh, and you, wor you are worshiped and honored by the masses as the ideal of the nation. Buddha did not believe in a personal God, yet we regard him as an avatar. Kapila did not believe in a personal God. In his Sankhya system, he says, Ishwar Siddhi Pramanabhavat. That is, there is no proof for the existence of a personal God who is creator of the universe. Still, Kapila was the greatest of all sages. We have hundreds of such cases because free thought was the watchword of the Hindus in ancient times. They had no bigotry and sectarianism. They did not mean by the Vedas a set of books which must be accepted as true in every letter, but they meant by Veda, wisdom. God is the ocean of wisdom, which is eternal and indestructible. There is only one source of wisdom which occasionally reveals itself to mortal minds, and through them the world learns something about the eternal truth. Who could have known anything about God if he did not reveal himself to mortal minds? We know from the life of Muhammad that when he was praying on Mount uh, Meru, I think there's a misprint, it says Hira, I think it's Meru, <laughs> uh, he had a revelation. Uh, he was living in a cave in the desert, and his heart was longing for a knowledge of the divine being and truth, and truth was revealed to him. Truth is not confined to any particular individual or nation, but it is for everybody. As the sun rises and shines equally upon the heads of all nation, even so does the sun of eternal truth shine and reveal itself among all nations. Whoever will long for such realization will find a way to the attainment of truth. This conception has made the Hindu mind broad and tolerant. It does not condemn anybody. The Hindu embraces uh, a uh, Muslim because Islam is a path to the realization of truth. He accepts Christianity because Christ revealed the universal truth among the Jews who had sectarian ideas. Christ said, quote, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make it set you free, unquote. Our Vedas say the same thing. Where then is the difference? Uh, <clears throat> 
And of course, what we uh, also realize, especially looking at interfaith ideas and interreligious uh, harmony and so forth, is that these uh, great seers and saints that have lived throughout the ages speak to a particular people at a particular time. And so they phrase things just as a good teacher would, just as Vedananda was saying earlier, uh, the, the teacher's brain has to be in sync with the student and the student has to be in sync with the teacher. So there's no point in them talking in terms that aren't going to relate to the people they're talking to. You have to know who it is you're talking to. So. Uh, Jesus was talking to primarily Jewish people, and so he spoke in terms that they would understand from their particular heritage. And uh, Mohammed was speaking to the nomadic tribes of, the, of uh, Arabia and other parts of the uh, Middle East, and so his message had to be put into terms that would make sense to them, using metaphors that would make sense to them. Uh, so. We have to remember that, and I think we have to remember that too when we're looking at any of the scientific things or the other, or the mathematical or the natural science that occurs in the Vedas, they're going to be put in terms that relate to the people of those times with their particular mindset. And so it might not always be too, as obvious to us uh, what they're saying as uh, it would have been to the people in those earlier times in, in that particular setting. <clears throat> the essentials of all religions are one and the same, and that is self-mastery, God-consciousness, self-control, and purity. These are the ideals. He is regarded as a civilized person by the Hindus who lives a pure and unselfish life, who is loving, kind, and compassionate to all, and he conquers avarice by generosity and hatred by love. But a man who robs others to promote his self-interest is not a civilized man, according to the Hindu ideal. And I do not believe that he is regarded as a civilized man according to the Islamic ideal either. The ideals are the same. A man must not be judged by his outside, but by his inner nature and character. The outward garb, dress, clothes, formality, and etiquette do not amount to anything. The Lord sees the purity of the heart. Yeah, and you know, so many religions put such an emphasis on that as to, you know, what kind of clothes you're supposed to wear and whether you cut your hair or whether you don't cut your hair. I always find that amusing. So some, some of them say you have to have a, shave all your hair off and the others say you, you, don't, you can't cut it at all. And so you have totally opposite ideas. Uh, th those kinds of things are not the essential parts of the religion. The Lord sees the purity of the heart. Quote, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, unquote. Purity of heart is the sine qua non of God vision. We must be pure in heart and loving in all, uh, loving to all, irrespective of caste, creed, and nationality. Any education that separates mortals from mortals and disunites brothers from brothers is not uplifting and should not be the ideal. Therefore, my brethren, I consider that the aim of education should not be mere intellectual culture and commercial ideals to gain a livelihood in the struggle of competition, but the ideal of education should be such as will elevate people from their ordinary selfish state into the unselfish universal ideal of godhood. Anything that makes us kneel down before that grand ideal is uplifting. A Hindu philosopher went to Greece and asked Socrates what he was studying. Socrates answered, my study is the study of human beings. The Hindu philosopher smiled and replied, how can you know anything about a human being when you do not know God? This is an answer that could come from a Hindu alone and not from any other philosopher because the Hindu alone from ancient times has regarded the individual soul as part and parcel of the divine being. The divine spark dwells within us, but we must recognize that divine spark is in all methods of education. We must regard the child who is born as a living God 
we must re regard the child who was born as a living God, and not that he was created out of nothing, and a soul was breathed into its body from outside, but that the soul of the child is the maker of his, its physical body. The soul is eternal, and it could never be created. It is the body that could be created. The highest wisdom is given only in the Hindu philosophy of Vedanta, and the Western world today recognizes this fact. When Christ said the kingdom of heaven is within you, he perhaps meant the same thing, but the Occidentals do not understand this meaning. We Orientals understand Christ better than the Occidentals do. The other day I was talking with an Englishman in Calcutta, and he said that he had a theory that the Hindu mind could understand Christ better than the Occidentals. I said, I share that belief because I know that the Occidental mind takes everything too literally, while Christ himself spoke in metaphors and parables, which should be understood in the same way that of the parables and metaphors of Buddha and Krishna. He replied, I believe you are right. So, my friends, we Hindus can give a new interpretation to the doctrines of Christianity and perhaps a new interpretation to the ideals of other religions from the highest standpoint of our Vedanta. And you know you see that influence uh, in Christianity as Christianity was struggling through that era when uh, the sciences were dis making all sorts of discoveries which were contradictory to the scriptures and they were having to kind of reinterpret things and come up with new ways of, of, of understanding their own scriptures. Uh, some of them were definitely influenced by Indian ideas. The, uh, the Gita was available to many of them and probably some other of the scriptures, some of the Upanishads perhaps had already been translated. And so they were using some of these ideas and you, you find a, a, a shift. Now some of the the sects of Christianity haven't kind of come along, and some of them came along later than others. But uh, generally speaking, there uh, did, did become a shift as some of these ideas uh, came into more common knowledge. And then they could see that those ideas were really in there if you uh, knew how to look for them. There again, just as he was saying with education, your mindset uh, and your value systems and so forth color what it is you're learning so you can and that's why we read books over and over again right we can read a book uh, at one time of our life and get something out of it and we come back to it maybe five ten years later and we see all sorts of new things that we didn't see before because our minds just weren't primed to see those things at that time we've learned a lot we've experienced a lot we've gone through uh, many different events in our life. And so we see things in a different light when we read things over again. So if, you know, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita or the Gospel of Ramakrishna or the Upanishads or the Bible, but reading it over and over again is, is a useful thing because you're reading it with a new mind. <laughs> Each time you read it, you're reading it with a, a more mature mind, a mind uh, that's gone through more experiences and uh, gathered more information. So let's see. We come to our uh, just about to our close now. So this is as good a spot as any, I suppose, to uh, to break. So we will see you again next week, uh, same time, same station. <laughs> let's close for the chant. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purname Vavashishate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Peace, peace, peace. <laughs>